Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to our worship on this Remembrance Sunday, the day that we gather to remember but never to glorify past wars, those who died or were maimed in them, to recall our brothers and sisters who still suffer in theatres of war and in lands torn apart by terrorism even today, and to pray with all our hearts for peace in the world that the lives of generations to come should not be blighted by the scourge of war and terrorism. May I extend to any visitors with us this morning a sincere welcome and invite you to sign the visitor's book and to join us for refreshments after the service. We have come together to worship God and to remember those who have lived and died in war or on peacekeeping duties across the world as they sought to serve others. We will confess with shame those occasions when nations have lightly chosen war rather than peace. We will pray for all who still suffer as a result of war and terrorism, and we will commit ourselves to work with all our strength to seek peace, to see peace and justice established throughout the world. Let us begin our worship singing what is often referred to as the RAF hymn, sung to the tune The Dam Busters March. The words are printed on your order of service, God is our strength and refuge. is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. These words of the psalmist, reflected in our opening hymn, also serve to call us to prayer. Please be seated. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, you are the shepherd of our souls, the giver of life everlasting. On this day when we commemorate and commend to you those who lived and died in the service of others, we are glad to remember that your purposes for us are good, that you gave Jesus Christ for the life of the world, and that you lead us by his Holy Spirit into the paths of righteousness and peace. Merciful and faithful God, your purpose is to fold both earth and heaven in a single piece. With sorrow, we confess that in our hearts we have so often kept alive the passions and pride that lead to hatred and war. We are not worthy of your love, nor of the sacrifice made by others on our behalf. Almighty God, pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of unbounded grace, you declared your reconciling love and power in the death and resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. Teach us who live only in your forgiveness to forgive one another. Heal our divisions, cast out our fears, renew our faith in your unchanging purpose of goodwill and peace on earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This morning we gather to remember the kindness of God and his favor to us in times of need. As we think of past conflicts, and especially the Second World War, let us remember the courage, the devotion to duty, and the self-sacrifice of the men and women in the Allied Armed Forces, the toil, endurance, and suffering of those who were not in uniform, the support of those who sent help from afar or came and stood by our side. Let us remember those who were wounded in the fight, those who perished in air raids or fell in battle, who are buried at sea or in some corner of a foreign field, and especially those whom we have known and loved, whose place is forever in our hearts. Let us remember also those who were our enemies, with some of whom we are now in partnership in a new Europe, whose homes and hearts are as bereft as ours, whose dead also lie in a living tomb of everlasting remembrance. Let us remember those who came back, those whose lives still bear the scars of war, those who lost sight or limbs or reason, those who lost faith in God and hope for humanity. Let us remember those members of today's armed forces who may not so much be deployed in theatres of war, but are nonetheless at risk in wider peacekeeping and counter-terrorism roles, in disaster relief and efforts to counter people smuggling and the drugs trade. May they help keep ordinary people safe without the need to become embroiled in conflict. We remember those members of the forces who have come back both to the United Kingdom and to the United States of America from deployments in recent years in Iraq and Afghanistan in coffins or on stretchers. The grim reality of war and even of peacekeeping. Let us Remember the continuing grace of God, whose love holds all souls in life, and to whom none is dead, but all are alive forever. 
as we approach 11 o'clock, I would ask you to stand to remember those whose lives have been sacrificed to build a world of justice and peace. Please stand. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. In a moment, we will hear the flowers of the forest played on the pipes, and Ian will go to lay a wreath at the war memorial in the front porch of the church, memorial which commemorates three members of this congregation who died in war, Major Anthony Frith Smith, William C. Hollis Hallett, and Harold E. Hutchings. And we also remember the members of the Black Watch who died here on Bermuda during the war and whose lives are commemorated on the memorial in the graveyard.
Please be seated. Having remembered, let us now express our sorrow for the wrongs of the past. Let us pray. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you should love one another as I have loved you. And so this morning, we come to you, Prince of Peace, seeking your forgiveness for our not being prepared for peace, for our not being prepared for a new way of living, for our not being prepared for the arrival of love's realm, for our not being ready for God's work here on earth, for our not being ready to speak out when love calls, for our not being ready to stand firm in the gospel, for our not making plans to destroy armaments, for our not making plans to wipe out injustice, for our not making plans to love our enemy. May Almighty God have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, Fill your souls with the possibility of heaven and strengthen you with the oil of righteousness. Then light up the world with the new hope you have been given. Make ready the world for the coming of Christ. Amen. We sing the hymn number 706, For the healing of the nations, Lord, we pray with one accord. Before you go off to CCY this morning, boys and girls, I wanted just to have a very quick word with you, but just staying in your seats this morning. Some of you may be wondering why I'm wearing both a red and a white poppy. And I'm sure that some of you will know that the red poppy represents the scarlet poppies which grew in the fields in Flanders in the First World War and which became the symbol of remembrance in the United Kingdom through the annual poppy appeal. Indeed, they were immortalized in John McRae's famous poem, In Flanders' Fields the Poppies Blow, Between the Crosses, Row on Row, that mark our place 
and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt, fell down, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders field. It was that poem that inspired a lady in America in 1918 to have the idea of wearing red remembrance poppies. She managed to find about 25 poppies in a store and distributed them. An idea which was then brought to the UK by a French woman. And in 1921, the red poppy was adopted by the Royal British Legion as the official symbol of remembrance. The white poppy didn't appear until 1933. What does it say on it? Can you tell everybody? Peace. Peace. Yes, it says peace uh, right in the middle. And it <coughs> came about because in the United Kingdom, the Women's Cooperative Guild, most of whom had lost a husband, a son, a father, some male relative in the First World War, wished to promote peace in the face of what they saw as the then growing tensions and rearmament taking place in Europe. It was and remains an expression of concern and commitment to work for a world whose conflict, or where conflicts are resolved without violence and with justice. Commitments that surely have a strong resonance with our Christian faith. And so it is that this morning I wear both a red and a white poppy, both to remember and to pray for peace. Sadly, we don't have time today for a children's hymn uh, before you go out to CCY, so let's just ask God's blessing on you before you leave us. Let us pray. Loving God, you created this world and saw that it was good. And so we ask you now to bless our children, that they may live in peace in a world that is not only good but just for all children everywhere. Amen. Enjoy CCY this morning. Hear the word of God as it is proclaimed in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 4, from verse 9 to 14. You'll find it on page 160 of the Bibles in the Pew. But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, how you once stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people for me, and I will let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me as long as they live on the earth, and may teach their children so. You approached and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain was blazing up to the very heavens, shrouded in dark clouds. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of birds, but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he charged you to observe, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord charged me at that time to teach you the statutes and ordinances for you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy. 
the epistle, Romans chapter 8, from verse 31 to 35. You'll find it on page 158 of the Bibles in the pew. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? The observant amongst you will have noted that was not John Skinner doing the readings this morning. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> We continue to hear God's Word as we turn to the pages of the Gospel according to St. John and read there in chapter 15 from verse 9 to verse 17. And you'll find this on page 109 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. John 15 from verse 9. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. To his name be the praise and the glory. Let us continue our worship now with the anthem for this Sunday, Hymn of Peace.
I had had the intention of going up to the pulpit for this part of the service, but I got kind of caught up in the anthem. So you just have to bear with me where I am. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It seems to me that there are two very different things that affect Remembrance Day and Remembrance Sunday these days. On the one hand, there is virtually no one left who remembers World War I, and fewer and fewer people who have first-hand memories of even the Second World War. On the other hand, however, television brings into our homes pictures of armed conflict in all parts of the world and of their tragic outcomes, whether in people killed or maimed, or in those who feel forced to flee their homelands for safety elsewhere. So despite the fact that we're approaching 100 years since the end of the First World War, and we're now 70 years from the end of the Second World War, there is a sense in which remembrance may have become more relevant to more people in recent years. Certainly in the United Kingdom, the return of coffins and of seriously injured service personnel in recent years has had an effect on the nation. So, as we come together on this Remembrance Sunday, what do we hear God saying to us in the Bible readings we heard just a few minutes ago? In the first one, while the writer of Deuteronomy may have been addressing the relationship between Israel and God, his words nonetheless speak to us about the need to remember the past. Indeed, the past is part of the story we all find ourselves in. Whether we're thinking of events around the time of Moses, some 12 to 1300 years before Christ, or of events of the 20th century. When our daughter was at college, she took part in a visit to World War I battlefields in northern France and Belgium, and she and her fellow student teachers were hugely moved by what they saw. Indeed, they were so moved that they bought flowers to place on the graves of the soldiers in a World War I military cemetery. Also, when she returned, she said that she thought it should be compulsory for all young people to visit such places. Maybe it would make us all think twice, or even more than that, about embarking on military action in the world. So let us never forget the lessons the past can teach us. Turning to our second reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, there are two big questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? And who can separate us from the love of Christ? Perhaps, perhaps we're a bit hesitant in responding to the first. After all, most of us have felt that someone has been against us at some point in our lives. And maybe we've not stopped to think about God still being for us in that situation. But that's exactly what God is. He is always there for us. He will always love us. Even if we get ourselves in a mess, even if we feel the world is against us, remember, God is still for us. After all, He made us all in His image, and He wants nothing more for each and every one of us to be in relationship with Him and with each other, indeed with the whole of His creation, something that is hugely important given the threats to the world's environment today. And I suppose the second question isn't so very different, for it's about our being separated from the love of Jesus, something that Paul goes on to tell us that we can never be cut off from whether by trouble, hardship, persecution, hunger, poverty, danger, or death. Basically, he's saying that there is nothing in all of life that can separate us from Jesus' love. 
How wonderful is that? All of us will at some time feel cut off from all sorts of things. Maybe we feel we're not accepted by the people that we think matter, whether that's at school, in church, in society generally. Or maybe we think that we just don't matter, that we're not worth very much. Or maybe we know we've done something we shouldn't, or we've messed up in some way or another. Whatever it might be, it will not, it cannot separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, a love that was so great that He went to the cross as a sign of that love, truly the love from which nothing can separate us. Turning then to our gospel reading, we heard there Jesus' commandment that we are to love one another just as He loves us. Easy to say, no doubt easy to mean, but not so easy to do. We all have people that we like, people we get on with, but there are other people that we find difficult, that we find hard to get on with, and even harder sometimes to like. Never mind love. But Jesus tells us that we are to love one another as He loves us, and He loves everyone. And it's not that He just said that. He meant it. After all, Jesus' love for us all was what took Him to the cross, and He talks about the greatest love a person can have being to lay down His life for His friends. I'm sure some of those who died in the various wars and conflicts over the past century thought they were laying down their lives for their friends, not just their fellow soldiers, but those they had left behind at home, family and friends. And no doubt they were. What is sad is that those in power in the world had put them in that position, that in their pursuit of power, the powerful had failed to love one another, that in their pursuit of power, they had put war before peace, hate before love, death before life. Jesus asked His disciples to remain in His love and to do so by obeying His commandments, the two most important of which are to love God and to love our neighbors. So, let's not think that love is something soppy, something sentimental. Love can be difficult. Love can be hard. It means being more concerned about others than yourself. It means following in the way of Jesus. And so, as we remember today those who have given their lives for others, we pray that we may never be put in that position. But above all, we pray that the whole world may indeed love one another, just as Jesus loves us. One man who did more than just pray for peace, but stood up for peace and justice and equality was Martin Luther King, Jr. Fifty-two years ago, he made the famous I Have a Dream speech. And our next hymn reflects on that speech, many of the aspirations of which still remain to be fully fulfilled today. We sing hymn 710, I have a dream a man once said, where all is perfect peace. <laughs>
Please remain standing uh, while we affirm our faith in the words of the affirmation of faith that's on the piece of paper inside your order of service. This affirmation of faith was written not by a collection of divines centuries ago, but by two 14-year-old boys within the last 15 years or so. A reminder to us that faith can be just as integral a part of a teenage boy as it can be of you and I. Let us repeat the words of the affirmation. We believe in God who made the sun and the sky, the stars and the sea, who calls us to live responsibly. We believe in Jesus Christ, who became human, who healed the sick, who taught to children, who made friends with sinners. He burned brightly and offended many. His journey was one of life and death and resurrection. His light continues to shine in darkness. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who inspires the scriptures and whose breath we breathe. We believe that God calls us to be a community committed to one another, offering a welcome to everyone, old and young, rich and poor, strong and weak. We believe that God calls us to be peacemakers, workers for justice, brothers and sisters, a light for our world. Amen. Please remain standing. We're going to sing again. Uh, the hymn is number 266. God the Omnipotent, King who ordainest.
Let us continue our worship in the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Lord, we lay before you this our offering, acknowledging that others have given much more, even their lives. May their offerings not be in vain. May we learn your way of peace. Amen. Church news. I fear I've quite a lot this morning. Uh, first of all, at six o'clock tonight, uh, there will be a service for wholeness and healing, uh, perhaps not inappropriately on Remembrance Sunday. Uh, I think by strange coincidence, the first such service I did in Scotland also happened to be on the evening of Remembrance Sunday. Uh, we will be seeking wholeness and healing, not just for individual people. Uh, we will be uh, praying for those for whom prayer cards have been submitted, but in addition to that, we will be seeking wholeness and healing for the world. That's tonight at six o'clock. Wednesday, handbell choir practice. Thursday, Bible study at the manse at 7.30. Uh, next Sunday, we're back to normal. Uh, that is an eight o'clock and an 11 o'clock service. And various other things to mention. Uh, you may have noticed, but you may not have noticed, that in this decoration there is a poppy. But it's not any poppy. It's one of the ceramic poppies from the Tower of London. Uh, one of the, wait till I check the number, 888,000, where are we? 246. So it's not quite unique, but it's possibly unique in Bermuda, I do not know. Um, it was given to the congregation by Barry and Hilda, uh, who had bought it from the Tower of London. So if at the end of the service you want to come and have a closer look, it's there, and there is a little booklet that tells you about it. I'll leave it on the corner of the communion table. Next Sunday, uh, our brothers and sisters in Cobbs Hill Methodist Church will be celebrating their 188th anniversary. Not sure that's particularly special, but uh, the, in addition to their service at 9.30, they have a service at 4 o'clock, um, and they invite uh, all who wish to come along to that. The speaker will be the Reverend Harold Lamb, uh, pastor of the Evening Light Pentecostal Church, and there will be special music by Septimus. That's four o'clock next Sunday. You will have got 
within your order of service, a flyer about the Christmas fair, which will be here before we know it, uh, November the 28th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, Anne, did you want to say a word? Okay, thank you. Good morning. It is appropriate, I think, that I'm up here to talk about the Christmas Fair, as Christmas is my most favorite time of the year. As, as uh, excuse me, Derek said, uh, we're three weeks away. Um, we thought, we put a lot of thought into the date that was chosen, trying not to conflict with so many other activities that our church members are involved in. So uh, it is the last Sunday of, of November. We also did make a change to the, uh, the times, so we are starting an hour earlier um, and still finishing at nine. I mean, excuse me, three, sorry. Nine till three. <laughs> I'm here to appeal to all of you for your time and your treasures. So whilst a lot of you are uh, um, volunteers for us every year, there are still some who are not. And we are asking if you would kindly think about giving an hour or two of your time. The uh, insert has the names of the fair conveners as well as all the stall conveners. So if you have questions, please feel free to call them or email them. Uh, we, and please do not assume somebody else is going to volunteer because unfortunately it doesn't always happen. So really appealing to all of you to, if you could give uh, a, an hour or two of your time or even ask a family member or a friend who doesn't uh, come to our church if they'd like to come along with you. And then treasures. Everyone has something in their house that they're not using anymore or they're just they're holding on to just because. So we have lots of times. Again, it's in the, the, um, the leaflet that you hope you will take home. Um, where you can drop off um, all your items. Again, talk to your family and friends to see if they would like to clear out their closets and their cup cupboards and their drawers um, and uh, help us with the fair. The fair, it does bring in a fair amount of money for the church, and uh, so it's, it's one of our biggest fundraisers, so all the help we can get is, is very much welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. One week before the fair, uh, there is uh, another evening uh, presented by the Mad Group uh, entitled Songs, Music and Drama from the Movie. So that's on Saturday the 21st of November. Reception from 6.30 to 7. Uh, buffet dinner, Italian style, from 7 to 7.45. Uh, there will also be a bit of a musical themes contest going on. Uh, but at 8 o'clock, the show will start. Um, and again, if there is anybody wishing to help, if there's anybody willing to come along and sing in the chorus, you'll be more than welcome. Uh, come along tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for a rehearsal, uh, and you'll be made very welcome indeed. Uh, we could do with adding uh, some numbers to the chorus. So if you have a voice, please think about it, and please come. Um, Jeff will be at the uh, Thorburn Hall, uh, delighted to sell you tickets. After this, I should say that the cost is $60 for adults, teens 20, and uh, 13 and under 10. Uh, and that's the 21st of November, beginning at 6.30. Uh, songs, music, and drama from the movies. Looking just a little bit further ahead, uh, our Christmas lunch is programmed for the 13th of December, but we have a slight problem in that Ben, who has catered for this in the past, is unable to do it this year. So anyone who has thoughts as to what we might do in that regard, please speak to Liz as soon as possible. Today, preferably, but certainly as soon as possible. And finally, I think, uh, if you are not coming, 
to the service at six o'clock tonight, uh, I would commend to you a crowning occasion uh, taking place in Wesley Methodist Church this afternoon, uh, the Bermuda Chamber Choir and Orchestra. Moira and I were there last night. It was a brilliant programme, but unfortunately it's too long for you to go at four o'clock and be at the service at six o'clock. So uh, if you are at all interested, it, it is a wonderful programme. It was very good indeed. I think that's everything, although I've probably forgotten something. Are you volunteering, Matthew? <laughs> Come and sing in the chorus. Let us once again bring ourselves to God in prayer. Let us pray. Risen Jesus, we thank you for your greeting. Peace be with you. The shalom of God. Deep peace, lasting peace. Peace that brings inner calm, that keeps a person steady in the storm that faces the persecutor without fear and proclaims the good news with courage and with joy. This is the peace that reconciles sister to brother, black to white, rich to poor, old to young. But not a peace that is quiet in the face of oppression and injustice. This is peace with God, the peace that passes human understanding. And now, Father, we pray for the needs of the world. Where there is war and conflict or any form of aggression, we pray for peace and security. Where there is injustice and oppression, we pray for justice and freedom. Where there is hatred and distrust, we pray for harmony and understanding. At this time, we pray especially for all the people caught up in the ongoing wars in Syria Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, Ukraine, South Sudan, Israel-Palestine, Somalia, and Yemen. And for all places in the world where people's lives are threatened by war and terrorism. We pray for world leaders and all who exercise influence over others. That they may act wisely and justly and always seek the common good. For the United Nations and all international organisations working for justice and peace. That they may be strengthened and upheld by your presence. We pray for all who suffer as a result of war and terrorism. Whether in body, mind or spirit. For all who have lost their homes and possessions. And now flee to foreign lands seeking peace and security. But rarely finding it. We pray for all who have died in war, those who have taken up arms, those caught up in conflict in any way, and all innocent victims of war and violence. We offer these our prayers through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, in whom past, present and future are brought together in one great hope. Renew our faith in you, Lord, so that the past may not hinder us, nor the present overwhelm us, or the future frighten us. You have brought us this far. Continue to lead us until our hope is fulfilled, and we join with all your people in never-ending praise. For in your name we ask it. Amen. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, we sing the hymn 161.
singing the first verse of the national anthem, which is hymn 703, not 701. dividing walls into bridges, bri bringing friendship in place of strife, being a neighbour to those near at hand and to those far away, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you this day and for evermore.